You are watching Caught for Two, broadcasting live from Champaign, Illinois, March 26th, 2023, Sunday at around 3 p.m. We are continuing our playthrough of The Case of the Blinded Birder, a game from MurdersByMail.com. We've got our reply. Um, anything to catch up on before we start? As a reminder, I'll be doing a live Q&A session tonight at 9 p.m. Central Time. I hope you can join me for that. Um, so our reply did not come in time for today, but they were nice enough to email me a PDF. So I have a printed PDF so we can play. I don't remember if last week I told you that I did get a reply to our bug report about stumbling on a mention of Mr. Wentz's body. And uh, the reply I got just said basically that the game expected us to discover this, to hear about the dead body being found somewhere else, no mention of where that was, but that they've now tweaked the game node, the, the text that someone would get at the house we went to, to fix it so it doesn't mention something doesn't mention that body before it should have. So we've contributed a little bit of a bug fix. All right, so um, turn 13, reply 12. Let's get a reminder of where we went. Let's see here. So we sent we sent the vicar out to Imogen's house, which Nicola noticed was on the map, that that's actually the house next door to Borley Wood is actually right near the murder scene. So there's the murder scene at Heller Hole. There's the bench from which our guy Albright was shot, and this house right here, the nearest neighbor, Nicola noticed was Imogen's. And sure enough, the game knows it too, because the game says it's the Bickford Smithy residence. That's Imogen, that's her name. And we decided, we couldn't decide whether to send Imogen to her own house or the vicar, but we decided, okay, on the very my more most minute chance that Imogen is wrapped up in this. Let's send the vicar. He can maybe snoop around her house. What if Imogen is that last lady in the in the um in the photo? Seems unlikely. Okay, so that's where we sent the vicar. Now where did we send Imogen? 
to E25, Sybil Eggle. I believe, okay, where, where did we send Imogen? Who remembers? Well, we sent Imogen. We decided now it's time to start pursuing some side cases. So we've got a we've got one main side case. That's these uh, box of uh, stuffed birds in some mystery. But we've also got these personal ads in the paper. And one is about a missing dog. Answers to cookie, generous reward offered. So we thought, okay, Imogen doesn't have that much pressing business. Let's send her to see if she can't, she and little, her little dog Wooster can't find this lost dog. And then Cecily, we sent to Albright's old place of business, the carpet shop, Longhurst Carpet. All right, let's see what they have to say. Are we ready? Anything else to talk about? Over the weekend on Friday, we played another Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes consulting detective case, An Ember of Distraction. Quite good. If you're looking for Sherlock Holmes consulting detective, more cases to play. Turns out the fan cases are very good. I'll talk a little bit more about that during the live Q&A. And if you have questions for me, to address on the live Q&A, but you won't be able to make it, you can submit those early on the Board Game Geek Guild section for this channel, which you'll find a link to on the YouTube About page. Okay, so let's take a look at today's replies. Okay, so here's our reply from Cecily. Let me... Zoom in here, see if I can't read it off the screen. Dearest Jesse, Cecily Miller, a marvelous morning to you, said Jason Longhurst as he found me waiting for him in front of his carpet store. I've finally ready to finally go wall to wall, plush in that lovely cottage of yours. Oh, not today, Jason, I said. It's concerning a murder, I'm afraid. He looked at me threw his eyebrows for a beat, unlocked the store, and led me into the high-ceilinged showroom. Bushels of carpet samples crowded the front and rolled rugs lined the back. He spoke as he turned on the lights. A murder mystery, you say? This must be about Rupert Albright. It is, I said. I understand he used to work here. I... He was one of my salesmen during the war, but ultimately I had to let him go. He had an arrogance about him, and his sales tactics tended to be tended to the bullying side. That sort of nonsense sometimes works, but sometimes it drives customers straight out of the store. Did you fire him because he lost a customer? I asked. Longhurst clenched his jaw. Hmm. Quite the opposite, actually. One day, a youngly, sorry, one day, a lovely young woman named Juliet Porter comes in, looking to buy replacement carpet for her bedroom. For some reason, she's desperate to get the job done quick, which Rupert seizes on. He lies. He tells her she has to pay ten times the normal price for a special order. It was the most profitable sale we'd had in years, but when I saw it come across the books and found out what he had done, I was furious. Refunded Mrs. Porter and let him go that very day. Goodness, I said, and I'll tell you, he continued, when I gave her the money back and told her that Rupert was no longer working for me, she didn't even look relieved. It's hard to describe. Cecily, somehow, huh? I got the impression she was afraid of him, like he'd bullied her so much that the money wasn't even important anymore. The whole affair made me sick to my stomach. All right, so what have we got here? This is kind of interesting. Uh, so Roberto was the one who decided to go here, and I think many of us were skeptical. This is a little bit interesting. M.E. Porter says, possibly the third woman? I don't think so. 
But I'll tell you what I do think. I do think this is a black... He blackmailed this woman. I think we've got a woman who killed her husband or something. And she needed the rug removed and he blackmailed her. And, or, and she's maybe, uh, so she's, she was happy to pay whatever it paid. And now she's afraid that him being fired is going to somehow come back to her. Um, I mean, this does fill in what we knew, that he was kind of a not a great guy and um, wasn't opposed to bullying and pressuring someone. But I don't feel like she's connected to our... I mean, this is years ago this happened. But I'm, I'm starting to think that Juliet Pointer was in a rush, desperate to get new carpet replaced for her bedroom and i wonder if this was his first blackmail first practice blackmail before he started blackmailing these other women jen says if it was blackmail he wouldn't put that in the books it's more about character he had potential for being a blackmailer okay i think you might be right Nicholas says, we were told that Albright left his job after his wife died, but he was fired, so he didn't tell the truth to his mother. Putting it through the business would boost his sales. Yeah, I mean, I guess he wouldn't get that money. The store would. He would, he would, get, he would boost his sales on the books, but maybe if he was blackmailing, he'd try to pocket that money. But... It almost feels like we've got a little side story here. Like we could visit Juliet Porter and try to find out why, press her on why she needed that carpet. Let's see. Let's see if there's a Juliet Porter in our directory. There is. It's a B61. All right. Lots of little side cases in this, side stories in this game. So if we wanted to, we could follow up with Juliet Porter and try to quiz her on why she needed that emergency carpet. It sure doesn't seem like it's related to our case, but it's interesting. I am curious. I mean, logically, it's a good point that it doesn't seem like blackmail, but on the other hand, she's scared of him. Like, he bullied her so much that the money wasn't even important anymore. Maybe, um, yeah, maybe she's just, like, nervous that any attention is being paid on to what happened. So maybe he didn't blackmail her. Maybe he just took advantage of her to pressure her. But she's just nervous that someone's digging into this. So... One thing we could do for fun is talk to Juliet Porter. The other thing we might do instead, or as a precursor, is I was just thinking there are a bunch of allies we haven't been to. The Historical Society, the Library, County Records of Births, Deaths, and Adoptions, and the Newspaper. So we could just sort of table this issue about whether we want to chase down Juliet Porter and instead do some of this, maybe we'll bump into hearing about a death of Juliet Porter's husband or something. But clearly not related to our main case, but it does feel like this, this game may have a whole bunch of little side cases that you could follow up on if you wanted to. All right, let's see what the chat says. Um, just that he was a shark and he smelt weakness and blood, blood in the water and took advantage of people. We haven't talked to his wife's family either. That's a good point. 
Yeah, that's a good point. In terms of, there's so many, we feels like we could drag on this game for months, which we may try to do. Just to chase down all these weeds. But you're right, we hear that the wife's family is farmers and we haven't visited him. Um, it could be that the archaeological women are the side case and Juliet is his killer. Well, I, that's a pretty big stretch. Juliet is from years ago. I don't think she wants the attention. We don't know the wife's maiden name. We would have to go to the record office for that. That's a good point. We think we located, like, the the road that their farm is on is a fairly small road. So we probably can find it. But I think it's a good point that going to the... In, Going to the records of the town could give us uh, their maiden name. All right. Um, let's read our next reply. So wait, let's see. This is letter 12. All right. Let's now we sent Imogen to our dog side case, the missing dog. Let's see if we can find that missing dog. Dear Jesse. That is so dear of you and your adorable pup to come by, said the elderly Miss Ezel. But I'm happy to say that Nutmeg made his way home on his own. As she said this, a muddy brown mutt peeked out from behind her and growled at us. Wooster wagged his tail furiously and did a hesitant play bow. Hush, nutmeg, she scolded. Miss Bickford Smithy here was just coming to check on your whereabouts. It's impolite to growl. Remarkably, nutmeg seemed to understand. His tail began to wag and he carefully came over to give Wooster a careful check. The bespectacled woman smiled at me. He's more scared than mean, I assure you. He gets out and goes exploring up in the woods around the dig, silly boy. And all it takes is a loud noise and he's scurrying back to hide. He thinks of himself as a great adventurer, but in fact he's meek as a mouse. Well, I'm very glad he returned, I said. Yes, well, I suppose I wasted my money putting that advertisement in the paper. I should have known he'd make his way back. The night he ran off, I heard a solid hour of gunshots from the cliffs over there. I should have guessed poor Nutmeg would be cowering until the clamor was well and truly passed. Hmm, I wouldn't expect gunfire from the dig, I said. Well, neither would anyone. But there's a house at the end of Frank's End where some fool has set up a firing range of sorts. Neighbors tell me that the lady scientists from the dig meet there on weekends to practice pistol shooting. Can you imagine? I wish they'd stop it. Gives Nutmeg the worst shakes, doesn't it, boy? She scratched behind his ears. Would you like some lemonade, dear? She asked me. We could let the boys in the garden to play. That sounds perfectly delightful, I said. Let's. Okay, so the side story in the paper, unfortunately, we were not needed to find Nutmeg the dog. But this is clearly another way to hear about the shooting range that we fortunately or unfortunately had already discovered. So this was another way to get this clue about the women dig people practicing their shooting. Nothing new for us here. All right. Next up and lastly is our vicar. Let's see what he's titled this report. The Butler Speaks. So he sent, remember we sent him to Imogene's house. Let's see what he says. I'd never been to Imogene's home before. Her late husband, I knew, was landed and liveried, not to mention fabulously rich. So I imagined a grand estate, all glossy granite and leaded windows, with outbuildings, stables, and a small army of servants. I got it about right. I was serviced by her elderly butler, Crutchley, who apologized as soon as he'd settled me into one of several immaculate drawing rooms. I'm afraid that Lady Imogen Smithy is out, he said. There's no telling when she'll be back. 
She left with the Jaguar two hours ago. She insisted once again on driving herself. The worry in his voice was plain. Even his stiff formality couldn't hide that. Well, she's an expert motorist, I said. Well, yes, sir, he said. And she'd never put Wooster in danger. No, sir, he said. I could see my attempts to soothe him were bearing little fruit. Uh, to be honest, it wasn't Imogen I came to speak with. I see her all the time in our book club, you see. It was you, in fact, who I thought might be able to help us. No doubt you were on duty the night that Rupert Albright was shot. Yes, sir, he said, unfazed. Worley Wood is just across the lane. Our stable master recalled a gunshot at about dusk. But that is not unusual, sir. Poachers make regular inclusions, incursions all about the estate. Do you know the names of any of these poachers? Well, only the ones who've been caught. James Grossler and Marcus Lennox. Both of them have been convicted in the past. When Inspector Swift came around asking these same questions, he seemed quite interested in those two. Oh, how so? Well, as the inspector said in the paper, he seemed convinced that since Albright was struck by a bullet in the woods, a poacher was the most likely culprit. Swift's questioning was largely if anyone had seen Grossler or Lennox nearby and so on. And had anyone seen them, I asked? No, sir, not them. He emphasized the them. I pressed, but... Someone else was seen. Yes, sir. Our driver, Wallace, was returning to the estate just after that dusk that night. He noticed a car parked across Borley Road. As he turned into the drive, his headlamps swept over it, and he caught someone he presumed was its driver emerging from the woods. It was a woman, sir. No one he recognized, but she was white as a sheet and raised her arm over her face as if to shield her eyes from the light. Or to cover her face, I suggested. Yes, sir, he said. Swift spent some time trying to get Wallace to remember any details about the woman or her car, but it had been long enough time that he really couldn't recall more specifics. Well... Um, this is confirmation of what we wanted confirmation of. That it's a woman driver. This is our suspicion that it was, in fact, Kathleen Carwood. No mention of her being seen with anyone else. White as a sheet. This seems like it's going to be Kathleen again. Kathleen Carwood, the head of the dig. The good shot who's known to be walking around looking white, I guess, from her blonde hair. Um, unfortunately, no additional information to help us. Except this sounds like she's alone. A driver emerging from the woods and no, no sign of an accomplice. So this is good evidence for us that that Kathleen was doing this alone. Um, let's check in with the chat here. Emmy says, just what we needed, putting one of the women at the scene on the day. Debbie says, presumably Kathleen, we can now place her at the crime scene. Nicholas says, interesting the mention of this Lennox, though. It's the first time we ever hear of him. Yes, you're right. So, um, a couple of things. So, first of all, you're right. Mention of two, two poachers. One, the cop, our cop, our local detective, was quite hot on, James Grossler. The other one, this new person, Marcus Lennox, that we've never heard of. Two poachers. J. 
James Grossler, the detective, is interested in. Marcus Lennox, we've never heard of before. Now, something occurred to me while I was reading this, although now that we've gotten this, it's a little less necessary. But it occurred to me that... So I'm just going to write down the address. Martin, what, Marcus Lennox is C26. Grossler we already knew about, but I'll add his address to this entry. This is C25, right nearby. Um, one thing did occur to me. We very quickly wrote off the poacher. We didn't believe it was the poacher, especially since, if you'll remember Cecily's letter, she points out he was shot while looking at the person, etc. It seems unlikely that a poacher would do it. So we knew it wasn't the poacher. But... Um, what we haven't really considered is, could a poacher have been around the area and seen something? So we know we don't suspect a poacher, but maybe they would be good candidate witnesses for us. On the other hand, we now have the woman seen at the, the scene of the crime. I'm not sure we can expect to get any better than that. Our theory is probably, I think it sounds like, what we were considering, like, we don't understand the nature of how this murder took place. Why is he over here at Heller Hole spying with binoculars to Borley Wood and then get shot by someone from Borley Wood? We're told there's a bench here that this makes a good rendezvous spot. It seems like our the most likely circumstance, tell me if you agree with me, the most likely circumstance is that Kathleen Carwood tells him, okay, meet me at the bench at Borley Wood, and I'll pay you off, right? He's blackmailing her. She says, meet me in Borley Wood bench. I'll pay you off. So she goes to Borley Wood, planning to kill him when he shows up. He is suspicious and paranoid. He thinks he might be being set up. So he goes to Heller Hole instead and is looking around for her. And they see each other at the same time and she gets off a shot and kills him. Or else she meets him she says, meet me at Heller Hole. He shows up at Heller Hole looking for her. She shoots him. Either way, it's a setup. The only thing that that is the wrinkle in the setup is it, it would be, you would think she would just meet with him, pretend to give him money and shoot him point blank. The weird part is that he was spot he was looking right at her with binoculars. But I'm not sure we can expect to get a better explanation for that. It now sounds like she was alone when she killed him. We think we know who she who the killer is. The good shot. So I'm not sure unless he told someone, unless he confided in someone that he was planning on going there. for some other reason, then I'm not sure we're supposed to get any more. The only thing I would love is I'd love confirmation that he wasn't, that she did set him up and say, meet me here, I'll pay you off. Because the other possibility is that she was meeting up with someone and he was spying on her. She saw him and shot him. But now this new witness that says there was one woman coming out of the woods, that seems to suggest that it was a setup and she wasn't meeting with someone. Let me see if the chat agrees with all this. Where did Wooster find the shell casing? Near the bench? Yes. 
Rob says, maybe it's time to visit Kathleen and see if we can spot her car or something, someone. Well, I agree 100% with that. Um, Kathleen is our number one suspect. We need to go to her house and go to any place where we might get information about her or her um, acquaintances. We would, it feels like she's acting alone, but we would like to know if the others are in on this. So it does make sense to me that we should visit Kathleen Carwood at her house. Where else shall we go? So we've got a side case. We've got a side case of the mummified birds, and we've got a bunch of contacts places we could go to follow up on that side case. We've got Jolly Run Freight Yard. We've got the informants. I think it might make sense to... to go to an informant. Okay, so we're agreed we're gonna go to Kathleen Carwood's house. Who do we want to send there? C-45 is Kathleen Carwood. Kathleen Carwood, C-25, C-45. So we should absolutely go there. But we don't, we need to decide who to send there. I think, um, I think we should send Cecily. Cecily is the one, if you'll remember, Cecily's specialty is sort of sussing out people. Right? She's good at understanding human nature, noticing details, being stubborn. I feels like Cecily is the one that would press her a little bit more. And Imogen is the upper crust person, but she's this is a this is a dig person, so I think Cecily's best suited. So I think we send Cecily to Carwood's house. Okay. Let's put a map, put a marker on the map while you guys think where you want to, where else you want to go. Let's see where it is. Is it near the dig? No. Let's see. Notice it's up a little bit near where the body was found, the other body. So she knows that area. C44, C43, C45, there's Kathleen Carwood's house. Um, so we also have the address of the woman, the other woman who's the archaeologist team. We know, we know two of the three, so we could go to visit her house, but I wonder if we shouldn't, um, use our other two leads to do side cases, like send one person to the, one of the mummified birds leads and another person to visit maybe one maybe um one of our informants either the newspaper person who has who knows a bit of gossip around town or the historical society 
or the library stacks or the births, deaths, and adoptions and marriages, county records. We might find the Albright's family if we want to chase down that lead. What does the chat think here? Let's see. No, you can't send two people to the same place and you can't go, you can't repeat your trip to the same place. Debbie says, would Kathleen be at her house, though? We already saw her at her dig. Well, I'm not sure if she'll be at her house, but you might think of that the other way. If she's not at her house, we might still be able to look in the window and see something. We might spot her car and get a notion of her car. There was also the Pints pub for the side case. Yes, Jan wants to go to the RAF base. Well, we haven't even been to the RAF base. It seems totally unrelated to our case. We haven't gotten a single lead bringing us up there. Other possibilities are, well, if she drove from her house, she had to drive this road. We could try to ask if someone saw something. We've got the thrush bogs, which are right near the scene of the crime here. Someone could have been in here and saw something. We've got... We're told that this bench has a view of the water, so it's possible we could see if someone overlooking this bridge saw something. I mean, these seem like long shots, especially since we're pretty sure it's Kathleen Carwood. We were told when they got the body out that the cart that took the body out got all muddy. So it might be that if we visit Kathleen Carwood's house, we'll find that her car is full of mud, maybe recognizable mud from the crime scene. That would be good proof. But we've already decided to go to Kathleen's house, so I don't have to make that case anymore. Um, so the pub, the Pints pub was from here, right? This was more, there's a, it seems like there's a bunch of clues related to our to our side case about the mummified birds. They talk about it down at Pints Pub. There's the Jolly Run Shipping Company. There's the Bakerly Chronicle. We could go to all these places. We could actually go talk to this guy, but probably we'd want to find it here. It could be that this side case is somehow involved with Rupert Albright. But I think we're going to find out that this is an old case, but Still, no reason we're not going to follow up on it. All right, let's pick one lead to do with the birds. So do you want to go down to Pints and hear what they're talking about? Or do you want to go to Jolly Run Company to see if what they can tell us about the shipping box labeled Kitchen? Or do you want to talk to the newspaper reporter? or the taxidermy shop. Okay, and Tina's been wanting to go to the taxidermy shop, so let's do that. Let's go to the taxidermy shop and ask about those birds. Okay, Yoli's taxidermy. All right, who shall we send there? Maybe the vicar? The vicar can do, it's good to send him to the places where he can't do much harm. Okay, let's send the vicar to the taxidermy shop. All right, one more place to go. We could, if we wanted to stick with this case proper, we could send Imogen to the shovel-wielding woman's house. Or we could just send her on a, that's Janet Rosso, who's at F20.
Emmy says, better send the vicar to the taxidermy shop because Wooster might get freak freaked out <laughs> by the taxidermy. Okay. Nicola's idea of going to the cemetery to find Albright's wife's name is good. She was buried next to him. Is that right? I don't remember those details. Do we know what cemetery she was buried in? I think we would be better off if we don't know what cemetery. If we do know what cemetery, it's not a bad idea. Otherwise, I think births, deaths, adoptions, and marriages would have the records of his wife's maiden name. The library stacks might have papers written by this trio of archaeologists. We might get the name of the third woman there. Same thing with the historical society. Um, we were told twice that he's buried next to her by the coroner and by the priest. Okay, what about, do we know what cemetery that is? Or is there more than one cemetery? Maybe there's only one cemetery. Or we could talk to Juliet, the person who bought the carpet. <laughs> Do we need the third woman archaeologist name? No, we really don't. St. Egwin Cemetery is where he was buried. So if we go to St. Edwin's Cemetery, we could find the wife's maiden name and then talk to the wife. Again, doesn't seem re too relevant to our case, but it's reasonable. But the vicar should go there, don't you think? What about trying other persons that might be in the woods? Rob says, I vote to interview, interview people close to our prime suspect. Maybe we can get more in our speak to Janet Rousseau or the, one of the poachers. Hmm. Trying to think. I mean, I think we've solved our main case. And we're going to talk to Kathleen. Maybe we don't need to know the third woman. She doesn't seem involved.
and Tina says I vote for an informant. If all else fails, one often finds ideas among the library stacks, births, deaths, adoptions, marriages. Um, all right, let's go to one of the informants. Let's sort of spread. We'll do one of each now. We're doing, we're doing one on our main case, one on our side case, and one sort of wild card informant. So we haven't been to one of these in a while. Let's decide. Do you want to go to the historical society? The library stacks or birth, deaths, adoptions, and marriages. Um, if we're going to go... None of these are that good. I don't know why I'm obsessing about these. Birth, deaths, marriages. All right, let's go there. Adoptions, abortions. Okay, let's go to the records of birth, deaths, marriages. Maybe we can catch, maybe we'll catch something, of, if nothing else, about Juliet Porter. All right, E1. So we're going to send Imogen there. Maybe she can talk her way into getting records that she normally shouldn't be able to get. This is county records. All right. I've spent a long time sitting here trying to figure out what to do, but really it's mainly because there's no great thing to do. I do think we should try to solve this side case, though, so maybe we sh shift into this uh, taxidermy birds next turn. Maybe we spend some turns focused on that. Let's do this, though. Let's see if we can... I mean, let's not lose sight of our main suspect. Um, and then we'll just sort of walk around as we, as we wrap up that case. All right. So here we go. Cecily is going to C45. Imogen is going to E1. County Records. The vicar is going to the taxidermy shop, B56. So a little bit of a shotgun scattershot approach this month, this week. Here, send our move. There we go. Already. I mean, we're in it now more for touristing, right? We feel like we've wrapped up the main case pretty well. But I would like to get those birds figured out. And I wouldn't mind talking to Juliet, who got the emergency carpet. <laughs> See if we can't get her to confess to murdering her husband. All right, we'll end this here. I'll see you next week for the next reply, and I'll see some of you at 9 p.m. tonight for a question and answer session. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.